here at the college for 25 years. Uh, currently wrapping up being chair of the Department of Biology, about to head on sabbatical. Uh, he's most interested in agriculture, bicycles, roots, and soil ecology. And, and I'll, I will say this because he didn't add this in his bio. He is literally one of the world's leading experts on the impacts of carbon overload on uh, in our atmosphere will have on plants and the soil food web and therefore implications of agriculture. If you go to Google Scholar um, through the roof, his work's been cited literally everywhere around the world. So really lucky to get some time with him today on this issue. And then equally as lucky to have uh, Lisa Young also talking to us. She's assistant professor of English at the college, interested in how environmental racism inspired new forms of medical and public health grassroots activism among black women writers with a particular focus on plant medicines and black women led community resilience. So really excited to hear how you two are gonna bring your expertise together as we wrap up our Climate Friday programming. So I think I'm turning over to Seth. If you have questions, please put it in the box and we'll have time for question and answer uh, for the last 15 minutes. So if not, write down your questions for them. All right, rock and roll. Can you all uh, hear me and see my um, PowerPoint presentation here? You're good. I'm good. Well, thanks everybody for inviting me. Todd, thanks for that great introduction. I almost think maybe my mother had something to do with that. Um, because she's the only one that would talk so nicely about me. And sometimes I wonder about that now, actually. So I, so what I thought we'd uh, do here is I'll start out, kind of talk about some boring science stuff, um, kind of from a broad global perspective, and then um, let Lisa take it from there and bring it sort of, um, bring things into a context that's more relevant for us here in the low country and here in Charleston. So first and foremost, um, Let's talk about where we came from agriculturally. So this is a, um, a, a graph of the last temperature series for the last 18,000 years or so. Um, and the striking thing here is how variable our temperature was until about 10,000 years ago. Probably not coincidentally, agriculture has been, is, is thought to be about 10,000 years old, maybe a little older. Um, so crop domestication kind of rose up um, at about the same time in history and a number of different places around the world. So it's probably this fairly stable climate of the Holocene that's made agriculture and agrarian um, lifestyle possible. Okay, so if you look at what's happening in this agricultural sequence just over the last hundred years or so, um, we've really taken a radical departure from the previous 10,000 years of how food was produced. So in the last hundred years, we we discovered oil. Um, human population skyrocketed um, since the Industrial Revolution, particularly since about 1940, 1950. Human populations have really um, skyrocketed all around the planet, and the way we do agriculture has been fundamentally changed. So you all know about the Green Revolution. Maybe from the 40s to the 1970s, really we transitioned to this um, more industrial form of agriculture that's very high input it functions or it runs on an energy deficit, it takes us more energy in, uh, in fossil fuel use to create a, um, a calorie of, of food energy than is sustainable. So we're running at an energy deficit, we're functioning on prehistoric sunshine basically, so that's not sustainable. So this climate changes uh, threaten to sort of knock us off this, this sort of stable 10,000 year run of temperatures that we've been enjoying. Um, the last point I wanna make from this is that throughout this um, 10,000 year agricultural run, humans have, uh, have collected all of this, um, this traditional ecological knowledge that I'm convinced we are quickly losing and have lost much of here in the last 100 years or so. Okay, so what are the major global environmental changes that our agricultural system is going to have to deal with in the future? Um, first and foremost, agriculture atmospheric CO2 enrichment. As you know, uh, CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere have been increasing for the last couple hundred years from about 280 parts per million in 1800, and we just surpassed 420 parts per million actually for the first time ever. So this is CO2 concentration here on this horizontal axis. So this is for rice. So this is what rice uh, biomass can do, uh, produce at 400 parts per million. 
And this is the amount of biomass you can generate in rice at 800 parts per million. So as a general rule, plants grow bigger with more uh, carbon dioxide. Now that's not true for all groups of plants. C4 plants like corn and um, sorghum and sugarcane don't realize very large benefit to high CO2 because of their physiological strategy for fixing carbon. The other major, well, let me add that although plants, uh, C3 plants grow much bigger in CO2 enriched environments, their nutritional quality decreases significantly. So this is a graph that shows protein of, of wheat flour on the or the vertical axis versus atmospheric CO2 concentration. So here we are at current ambient levels. Um, and as you increase the, level, the concentration of CO2 that wheat is grown in, its protein concert, concentrations steadily decline. Important implications there for human nutrition, clearly. Um, this bottom graph is a summary of 125 different crop species. Basically what this shows is the um, concentrations of essential minerals at elevated CO2, 689 parts per million, million relative to um, concentration in today's crops. So across the board, we see nutrient um, mineral levels are, are consistently decline when you grow those plants in elevated CO2. And protein declines in a number of crops, barley, rice, wheat, potatoes, etc. So plants are less nutritious. Crop plants will also have to contend with um, global warming. So we have this increase in um, temperatures, both means and extremes. This kind of tells the whole story for temperature responses. This is wheat yield in Mexico. So on this um, vertical axis is yield in tons per acre. This is January through March nighttime mean temperatures. So with an average nighttime temperature of eight degrees Celsius, you can um, expect to get six tons per, uh, per hectare of wheat yield. If you increase the temperature to 11 degrees, that yield goes to 4.5 tons per hectare. So a pretty radical drop in, in yield can be expected in wheat. Um, and also our other field crops, including rice and soybeans. So the third environmental change that crops are gonna to have to contend with are, are climate, uh, is climate variability. So we're gonna have more extreme, extreme events, more extreme rainfall events, longer droughts, more extreme droughts, um, things like that. So Basically, um, it, this, this shows the temperature or the um, record of corn yields from 1960 through 2008 or so. And most of the years with, with poor corn yields, yields can be explained by some unusual climatic event, a flood or a drought, um, early spring frost, something like that. So these unusual events are, are the new norm and so are expected to challenge our ability to produce crops. So this is, uh, these are data from a paper that just came out actually last week. Um, and this is from a group at, at Cornell. And they found that total factor productivity of crops has been reduced 21% by anthropogenic climate changes since 1961. So total factor productivity basically is, um, is a measure of aggregate agricultural output per unit of measured agri uh, aggregate input. So essentially, we're getting less um, agricultural output um, now for a given amount of inputs. Okay, so we have compensated to some extent since 1960 for these reduced yields by just using, by putting in more, more irrigation water, more nitrogen fertilizers. But that's not going to be possible for long because we've upset the balance of uh, biogeochemical nitrogen cycling. So that's not sustainable. And we're running out of irrigation water um, this is a map of the United States showing the cumulative groundwater depletion from 1900 through 2008 for 40 different important aquifers around the United States. And the take home message is that in all but a few of these aquifers, we are depleting the aquifer at a rate that's faster than natural recharge. So we're running out of groundwater, which should um, alarm you a little bit. So we've got some real challenges that the agricultural system is going to have to deal with in the future. 
So if you go into the literature, um, you can find lots of different strategies that have been proposed to build a more resilient agricultural system. Um, the Food and Agriculture Organization is calling, calling a lot of these techniques climate smart agriculture. So how do we build an agricultural system that doesn't emit greenhouse gases, that instead sequesters carbon? And how do we build this agricultural system so it's just um, and can, contributes to healthy social systems? So that's smart uh, climate, smart agriculture. So this is kind of a laundry list of some of the ways that we need to, uh, some of the techniques we can use to fix our agricultural system, regenerative agriculture, agroforestry, intercropping, um, traditional composting, you can read through the list. So there's a lot of different um, tools that we can use to kind of become more sustainable. But none of these are new, right? So these are already, all of these strategies are already integral components of indigenous or place-based agrarian agricultural societies. We've been doing this for 10,000 years. We just need to kind of rediscover these techniques um, that have been developed and are tried and true. So we've abandoned these in the last 10,000 years in favor of, of more of a totalitarian monoculture agricultural system, but um, these are not new ideas. So traditional agricultural techniques are, are highly variable um, and, and that's because they're built really um, to work within a given environment. So what will the environment support? Um, what what um, qualities, what's the natural soil like? What are the rainfall patterns? Do we need crop resistance, crops that are resistant to drought, um, et cetera, that sort of thing. Traditional ag techniques do share some, some characteristics. They tend to combine species and structural diversity in time and space. So traditional agricultural systems tend to foster biodiversity of microbes, um, animals, insects. They promote natural cycling of, of, of nutrients. So nutrients are sourced locally. They're not brought in in the form of chemical fertilizers from somewhere else. Traditional systems tend to value biodiversity and biological interde interdependencies. Um, they provide pest resistance through natural means such as co competition or interference rather than chemical inputs and things like that. So we, they combine species in time and space. They ex tend to exploit all different microenvironments that differ in soil, water, temperature, et cetera. Um, as opposed to current agricultural systems, which, which, which strive to homogenize the environment um, into one single uh, environment that's conducive to the growth of a single crop like corn or soybean or whatever, monocultures. Finally, they rely on local resources plus human and animal energy using little modern technology. So I wanted to emphasize here toward the end of my contribution, um, the, the fact that there are lots of edible plant species. 50,000 is, is an estimate of the number of total edible plant species on the planet. Um, but today, just 15 of those provide about 90% of global food calories. And just three of those, rice, corn, and wheat, provide over two thirds of global food calories. And what's concerning is that rice, corn, and wheat, as I explained earlier, are not going to do very well in a, in a changed, in a, in a climate change world, right? So they don't tend to tolerate high temperatures and extreme weather events. Yet lots of these other edible foods, edible crops do in fact tolerate drought stress better. They tolerate um, stress from herbivores. They're more, more resistant to fungal pathogens or bacterial pathogens. So we need to sort of rediscover a lot of these forgotten crops. And here's a list on the right. Um, and the list goes on and on, sorghum, millets, uh, cow peas, et cetera, et cetera. So how do we basically convert, uh, sort of cut back on the rice and corn and wheat and, and embrace some of these alternative forgotten crops? It's a big question, I suppose. So I think earlier Todd referred to this situation as a wicked problem. It seems pretty easy to me. Um, I'm just a dumb botanist, but it seems pretty easy how we fix the agricultural system here. And um, I'll kind of explain it to you. So here's where we are. We're at this, we're in this industrial agricultural mode. And this is where we need to be. We need to convert to this climate smart agriculture. The question is, how do we do that? 
Well, I would argue first we need farmers. We need people back on the land. So we need to sort of reverse this urbanization trend and um, remember, preserve, and rele relearn our traditional ecological and indig indigenous knowledge. So we need to apply some of the things that have been learned over the last 10,000 years to sort of go um, technologically backwards and reinvent what agriculture used to look like. And I think we need to, we need to um, uh, leverage modern science, plant biology, soil science, ecology, et cetera. We need to change perverse government subsidies, right? So by and large, our subsidies are propping up a very small percentage of industrial agricultural practices around the country. So the top um, five biggest producers of, of food receive the lion's share of agricultural subsidies. So we need to stop doing that. And we need to change our, our government subsidies in ways that promote um, a more sustainable agricultural system. We could put some Pigovian taxes in place. So for that uh, man burger that, that, um, that, that you get at Hardee's, there should be, um, we should pay for the externalities that are associated with that burger. There's a lot of carbon that's emitted. A lot of nitrogenous uh, wastes are produced. So we should pay for those. Those are externalities. And those, those costs need to be brought, um, brought forward. And at the same time, we need to, we need to reward um, agricultural practices that sequester carbon and subsidize those and artificially deflate the price of those products. So I've pretty much got it all figured out here. Um, we just, I guess, gotta get, gotta get to work. Um, so with that, I'm gonna pitch it to Lisa and she can make some of this stuff a little bit more relevant and interesting in terms of uh, what's going on here in Charleston and Low Country. Lisa? You're muted, Lisa. All right, thank you for letting me know that. Um, can you all give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Because I heard my volume was a little low. Thanks, Seth. Um, thanks, Blake and Maya and Julia <laughs> and Caitlin. Okay, so I want to pick up where Seth left off. And one of the questions he was asking is how do we either return to or either learn from traditional agricultural models, um, even if we don't necessarily return to them, what are some of the implications and the, um, the things that we can learn from uh, and glean from um, this historical lens of interacting with the environment? But then also I think Seth is bringing up a really good point about rediscovering the value, as he says, rediscovering the underutilized crops based on the local ecology. So that's what my talk will take, um, or that's the lens through which my talk will um, manifest. I'm gonna share my screen. And as you can see on this screen, the title of the talk is What Black Women Writers Have to Teach Us About Climate Change. And I've given this talk before and I've usually called it What Black Women Writers Have to Teach Us About Climate Change or the Future. But in this particular talk, because I wanna pick up on what Seth is talking about, I wanna ask what can Black women writers teach us about the future of medicinal plants? And as a way of kind of like opening up and setting the stage for that, I really want to, let me make my screen a little bigger. I really want to begin with this, this talk back forum that a couple of social justice warriors in Charleston um, and I put on in 2019. And it was called Come On, on the, Come on in the Room, Afrofuturism as a Retroactive Form of Healing. And this title comes from Sarah Days, who is the daughter of Natalie and Ron Days, who produced the children's show, Gullah Gullah Island, which many of you all might be familiar with. But she was thinking about how can we collapse the past and the future to really think about what we need to do in the, in the present. And that's where we began to explore these notions of into thinking about how Afrofuturism can give us some kind of context for thinking about environmental justice, or at least open us up to thinking about environmental justice. So if we go back to the slide, I kind of added environmental healing into um, Sarah's title. But 
what I'm picking up on is my research project, which looks at um, this um, phenomenon called restrictive covenants. And restrictive covenants were these legal deed contracts that manifested themselves in the form of housing, con housing contracts, which um, in a lot of urban centers, white people decided that they didn't want to rent their homes to, or they never wanted to sell their homes to black people. And so in the imagination, that's how we get certain places like Chicago or um, uh, DC or Detroit or Harlem, right? And even maybe someplace like Ch or Charleston. So we're beginning to ask this question of, what does restrictive covenants, what do they convey to the people that they left out? And how did they affect some kind of harm, bodily harm onto them? And so in my research, I began to pose this question and I pick up here from um, Ruth Wilson, who is the geographer, and she defines segregation, or I'm sorry, she defines racism as the state sanction or extra legal production of exploitation of group differentiated vulnerability to premature death. So even if you don't, even if that, that phrase seems bulky and lengthy, the main things that I wanna pick up on is her saying that racism is the vulnerability to premature death. And I think with something like Afrofuturism, we can then begin to work through how people before us, or um, traditional societies as it relates to the Gullah and Geechee, for instance, in Charleston, how they began to get themselves to freedom or liberate themselves. It gives us another lens, another mode of thought. And so I really like this definition that um, Kamisha Jackson offers us for um, Afrofuturism, even though there are so many different um, definitions. She says that Afrofuturism for her is something that deals with our past, our future, and our present, our spirituality, our ability to love, to willpower, connections to family and language. And I really love this idea of language because language is a technology. It's a way that you can conceal certain things um, that you have to say or certain things about you um, as it relates to who you want to be in dialogue with. But then it's also a way to express yourself, to give yourself power. And so what I think about, the way I begin to think about uh, Afrofuturism in my classes or for my students is I begin to tell them that it's just simply a new mode of thought. It's this new way of understanding the world, opening yourself up about, about the world as it relates to the natural and the built environment, and then um, using that to move throughout the world in a particular way. So then I have these 10 pillars of Afrofuturism that I often um, uh, bring up, and I'll go over them really quickly. But the first is that Afrofuturism, and let me see if I can make this bigger. All right, so Afrofuturism, and um, sometimes we can think about this as the African creation myths, but the number one thing or the most important thing, I always feel that Afrofuturism always harkens back to Africa in some way. So we can think about the Ankara print that you may see in African countries as, as part of their clothing. We may think about um, these Adinkra symbols that you may see, which stand for, they're symbols that stand for some um, larger meaning or philosophy or moral value. Um, um, and then this one, this is the Gina May symbol, which is which means that God is always present. Um, and then the ancestral aspect is always present. So there's some way that the ancestor is always revered. And as I tell my students, um, every country always reveres the ancestors. So it, even when we say the Pledge of Allegiance, right, or even when we're saying the Star Spangled Banner, that's like paying some kind of um, uh, that, that's paying some kind of respect to those who have fought on behalf of our liberties and freedoms and have created this world in which we live in today. Um, number three, time is not always linear. Sometimes time skips, it goes back and forth. The work is not always about the future. Sometimes the work is, is just as much about the past to help you to learn more about the future. And then number five, it's not just about imagining black people in the future. So if you, if you create an Afrofuturist story and the same colonialist logic that represent um, Black people and how they are today, racism, sexism um, persists, then you haven't quite created an Afrofuturist text because there's a more expansive way of thinking about Blackness. It can be postmodern, it disrupts um, these um, traditions or these societal truths 
to give us a new way of learning about the world. Um, and then gender can be a social construct in that sometimes we decenter gender to tell a new story about how these bodies are becoming policed by certain aspects of society. Um, and in, in that way, it can also be post-human. So in the African um, creation myths tradition, um, a lot of the creation stories begin with um, animals like a shoe, who's this character that's a monkey or brother bear, who's like outwitting God in some particular way. And then finally, um, it's embedded in the intellectual tradition of signification and symbolism. So what then am I trying to um, ask students to think about is I'm trying to ask them to read symbols, trying to use Afrofuturism, this mode of thought to read a picture like this, right? So if you see this picture, if you don't have an Afrofuturist um, understanding of, of this particular, or if you don't have an Afrofuturist uh, understanding, then this particular image becomes illegible, right? Like you're not sure what to do with it, what to make of it. Um, but then after I give them those 10 modes of thought, um, or pillars, they begin to think or ask questions about like, why is the spaceship, you know, at the head or in the mind? What is having a spaceship as a mind symbolized? Why are her eyes blocked out? But she has like these two um, birds, a black bird and a white bird on her shoulders. So how does that relate to being able to see, you know, with a bird's eye view instead of like this human vision? What do the katanas um, symbolize and why are they on her back um, instead of forward facing? We see the ancestral presence. Um, we see this Isis symbol. Um, we see this garden, we see this moon, which is, you know, maybe indicative of like a feminine presence. So we begin to read this, these Afrofuturist perspectives onto an image. And so I want to begin here by using this as a moment. Um, let me see if you all can. Let me share my screen so you can see the right screen. All right. Okay, so I want to begin here. Can you all see the screen where Tony K. Bambara Salt Eaters is up? Is that up? Okay, good, thanks, Julia. So I wanna begin here as a moment to think through what black women writers, how they, even if their texts are not Afrofuturist, how they invite us to think about um, navigating through environmental um, concerns or traumas from this more expansive view. So how they, fold into their reality and make sense of, you know, the, the housing crisis that they're facing as being similar to the way in which we degrade the environment. And so um, Tony K. Bambara's The Salt Eaters um, is this text where this Black woman is part of a coalition, an organized coalition, and she's fighting against, um, she's fighting against this nuclear plant that has moved into her community. And then at the end, she becomes so exhausted with the fighting and, and being on the front lines of, of being part of this laboring movement that she ends up in the hospital. And so the very first line of the text begins with this line that, that says um, from this healer, she, the healer asks her, are you sure, sweetheart, that you want to be well? There's a lot of weight when you're well. And I wanna pick up here with this line because um, Nikki Giovanni came to um, College of Charleston maybe two years ago now. And she came here after the publication of her book called A Good Cry. And she said that, um, a good cry was a result, or she she titled her text A Good Cry because she had just survived cancer and she went in to the doctor and the doctor said, you're suffering from hypertension. You're eating too much salt, like get rid of all the salt in your diet. And she said to him, like, I'm not suffering from too much salt. I'm suffering from not releasing the salt. I'm suffering from not, you know, crying about it. And so her text then or her poetry was about releasing that salt. And so Tony K. Bambara, I think she's remixing. If we go back to the 10 pillars where we're saying it's about signifying and, and building off of something, she's kind of like re, like signifying or signaling to us um, Tony K. Bambara's The Salt Eaters where this um, protagonist is losing herself 
And then the healer says, I'm going to lose the patient too. I just can't seem to generate the energy to bring her back and restore her. And this idea of having the energy, having the right tools, the skills, right, to be able to, to heal is, um, it kind of folds into how I'm thinking about climate change and Black people and the value that, or, or maybe even like what we need to be thinking about as it relates to um, how environmental racism has created conditions in which Black people have had to turn to the land and have had to um, have a connection with certain plants to be able to have some kind of way or modality of healing themselves. And at the end of the book, she ends up being able to heal her only through this wizened community of ancestors, which again, harkens back to the ancestral presence. And then um, as a result of these ancestors, um, you read this line where it says, suddenly the needle in her mind, which is this imagined phonograph that plays the sound of her memories back to her, causes her to lift the actual needle, needle, which is sedating her, to yank the arm away and pull away the machinery in favor of her own voice. So I want us to begin to like really think through Afrofuturism as opening up ourselves to um, think about how we can connect with, with the land to understand what what it can teach us about healing. And so um, Langston Hughes has this poem called Restrictive Covenants that he, he published in 1948. And he says, in Chicago, they've got restrictive covenants or they've got covenants restricting me, hemmed in on the South side, can't breathe free, but the wind blows there, I reckon the wind must care. And if we take someone like Anne Petrie, who is this author, um, from the 1940s, who one of the, the lesser known facts about her is that she actually gets her degree in pharmacology. Um, and so her, her family is one of the first pharmaceutical or black owned um, pharmacies in Connecticut. We can get a sense of like why she's incorporating so many instances about breathing and breathing insecurity and how the environment creates these moments which kind of like restrict the breath and restrict you from being able to, to live freely. And so um, I won't go into this because I think some of you, you can read this about how um, environmental racism manifests its way or manifests itself in ways that are um, that cut off the breath. But this goes to my next point, which is about how during these moments of environmental racism and housing um, segregation, there was also the aspect of segregated hospitals. And that brought on this, this impetus to figure out how to heal. Um, and there's this documentary called The Power to Heal. So if we're thinking about climate change, and if we're thinking about someone or a group like the Black Panther Party who has, or who was doing all of this medical activism um, and the civil rights movement, which really the start of the civil rights movement was about saving um, the lives of Black people, then we can begin to think about um, what Dr. Monica Wright White calls agricultural resistance. And um, in Seth's field, as it relates to biology, we think about agricultural resistance as like, how do we continue to produce crops that are able to withstand um, certain chemicals or able to withstand the, the natural environment, the changes in the natural environment. And Dr. Monica White, who was just invited here to College of Charleston, I think it was last year by the Sustainability Institute and Todd, she says that she's thinking about agricultural resistance a little differently. She's asking the question about how do Black residents engage in food production or plant production um, in ways that transform communities and build community su sufficiency or self-sufficiency. And um, part of the things that she says about agricultural resistance is that there's some form of economic boycotting, right? Because you can use, you can live on the land and you can become self-sufficient in ways that you don't necessarily have to be part of the larger capitalist society. Um, and this is really the, the foundation of the civil rights movement. And so there are a lot of farmers who, who gave way or who helped provide the, um, 
the foundations for the civil rights mo movement. And so ultimately she's asking how can urban agricultural resistance be used for self-determination and self-sufficiency? And I think that one way we can begin to do that is using or thinking about how climate change is affecting black medicinal forms of healing. Um, I went to a conference recently and one of the, um, one of the speakers talked about there are multiple practitioners of black, um, black forms of healing. We can think about it as the commoner, someone you found just around you, who you may tell, you know, like, oh, I'm not feeling well, I have a headache. And they may give you, they may tell you something um, almost as, um, or they may tell you like an antidote that you can take. Um, but then we have specialists and doctors. We have the witch doctor, a conjurer, a folk practitioner um, who has uh, more so uh, are different ways of thinking about healing. And then we have a spiritualist or someone who's more intuitive. Um, and then some of the things that I, I found really interesting as we're thinking about climate change is how certain um, remedies that were used in the past, like cotton root, chokeberry juice, and the Carinso plant, those are no longer forms of healing because of the changes in the geography. And so just kind of like ending, I want us to really, or I, I want this talk to really think about how um, climate change has an effect on black traditional healings because in a sense that there were segregated spaces, there were also segregated hospitals, which meant that black people had to figure out um, what were the ways that they could um, get some form of, of healing. And so climate change, produces um, at least three important things that we need to begin from and or at least three important um, topics that we need to ask. And that is um, how does it remove black people from familiar lands and crops? How does the flooding of lands is particularly in a place like Charleston, South Carolina, um, which is projected to be many places are projected to be underwater in the next 10 years by 2030. How is that forcing migration or cutting people off from lands and, and herbs and practice and remedies that they know um, and are familiar with? And third, how is climate change restricting subsistence farming or fishing? And subsistence farming and fishing really is about um, not needing a license to access the waters or access land to grow whatever it is that you need to be to, feel your, to feed your family on a daily basis. So I'm going to end with this quote loved and with, which is from Lucille Clifton, who is this poet, and she published this um, collection of poetry called Good News About the Earth, and she says, being property once myself, I have a feeling for it. That's why I can talk about the environment. And so I'm going to end there, and I think we can go to question and answer. Uh, thanks so much, Seth and Lisa. Awesome stuff. Yeah, amazing. Thanks for your wisdom, sharing all that with us. Uh, we're going to open up to question and answer and um, start with Seth if there's specific questions for Seth because he actually has to um, take off here in a couple minutes to teach at one o'clock. Um, Blake, if, if uh, you wanted to begin, um, he had private chatted me with um, a possible question for Seth. So uh, we can bring that if Blake is still here. I'm looking Yeah, Blake is. Um, if you want to bring that forward and please do all use the chat box. We'll just read them out. Um, Lisa and Seth can obviously see it directly um, or we can go verbal with a, a raise hand type thing. But um, yeah, so questions first for Seth to start with. Um, Blake, let's go for it. Hi Seth and, and Lisa, thanks for your talk. My, my question is, is pretty simple for someone who's, who's not a scientist. I'm just curious, why are the uh, mineral levels dropping in crops when they're actually increasing yields for CO2. If you could help us understand that, that, that's, that was a really interesting uh, nuanced point. Yeah, so basically it's a dilution effect. So CO2 is converted into sugar, carbohydrates by crop plants. And so plants have a larger carbohydrate balance and they grow a bit bigger, but they don't take up um, nutrients in, in, at the same rate that they take up more sugar. So. Essentially, uh, it's just increasing the carbohydrate content of the food we eat, 
and um, at the expense of, of minerals, other minerals. Cool, thank you. Um, Marianne, do you want to ask verbally or I can read it? You can read it. Okay, cool. So Seth, uh, can you please talk a bit more about seed protection? And then Lisa, maybe you can follow up a little bit more depending on where Seth goes with this and, and tie it back in what, with what you're seeing locally. So Seth, starting with you, um, seed protection, maybe more specifically like the need for that within the context of rapid climate change and changing soil and climate conditions. Yeah, I mean, so you're, you're referring to the preservation of germplasm, yeah? Right. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, so we've already lost some germplasm globally. Um, there are, um, our own Department of Agriculture has uh, um, spends a lot of time preserving germplasm. There are other countries around the world that are preserving germplasm, um, but we need to be, um, doing our best to safeguard land races of these various crops, these what I described as forgotten crops, so that we don't lose them for sure. Um, yeah, good question. Yeah, and I may not be answering this in the most scientific way, but when I think about seed protection, I may have mentioned this at the opening, but um, there is a lot of research that talks about how slaves that were transported into the new world, like they, they preserved certain plants and seeds on them, on their bodies, in their hairs. Um, and I think that has a, a, a lot to do with what they think they might have needed in terms of subsistence. And I know that we live in a different society. We live in a, a modern society where maybe our needs are different, but scientifically, biologically, right? Like there are certain nutrients that like, because of the way in which our farming practices kind of like manifest today, we don't have an abundance of those nutrients because the soil is more a little bit more depleted than before. So I'm thinking about protecting those crops which can have some kind of livelihood or, or some kind of effect on preserving you know, future generations or maybe some of the illnesses that, um, I'm thinking about the fact that we're in a pandemic and you know there are all kinds of, there were all kinds of, of studies done to, to think about what is the best vaccination or the, the best course to, to take for the vaccination. Um, and I think the more that we have to draw from, the better we can as a society like live in it and thrive in it. So I don't know if I'm asking or answering the question about seed protection, but those are the things that are coming up for me. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Marianne, for the question. Um, I got one for you both, actually. Um, in, in all three minutes, we got to bail out of here, Seth. So. Uh, you didn't, so if we're going to talk about futurism and using science, Seth, you didn't talk about genetic engineering, which, which might actually be what we need. And, and Lisa, does not genetic engineering play into some sort of futuristic perspectives of, of benevolent good, maybe? Um, right, I'm trying to channel a question here, everybody, for those of you who don't know me, um, right? From another perspective of using technology and climate change for good that doesn't look back to like anachronistic right, peasant life ways. So we can imagine somebody maybe thinking and asking this way. So yeah, Seth and Lisa, what do you have to maybe say about that? Um, well, actually I, I didn't mention genetic modifications, GMO crops in specific, but that's part of our scientific toolkit that we can combine with tra traditional ecological knowledge um, to build a more re um, resilient food system. So in terms of genetically modified organisms, um, the genie's out of the bottle. It's, I mean, we have it. It's part of, it's, it's here to stay. We need to try to um, do as good a job as we can stewarding those genetically modified organisms and making sure that um, we're doing the right thing. But that's a part of the solution. Yeah. And I'm, I oh, I'm sorry. Uh, please go ahead. Okay. Yeah. You know, you know, when you're talking about like genome editing and, and things like that, I always feel like, or like, you know, drawing back or thinking back to maybe how this is primitive, if we're always using 
the past as a, a roadmap, I'm reminded of something that someone, like one of the speakers said in the reparations forum that we just had. And she said that it was like slavery is not something that she's sad about. It's an honor for her because it's this moment in which she learns from it. Um, and so I, I think that even in all that we do, geno genome editing, I think has its plus and cons or pros and cons. And I think that there are things that we need to study about how, you know, how we're, you know, it, I don't know doing things with human DNA that can um, bode, maybe not bode well in the future. But I also think that um, it brings us to a moment to really think expansively about what is where can science take us and then where can or how can we use the information that we've gleaned from the past from history to really um, move forward in constructive ways and this is where i think um nancy tawana who talks about the epistemologies of ignorance i think this is where her work can come in where she's asking us to think about what are the ways are, in which our paradigms or the ways in which we think um are so limited that we engage i know todd in our um our sustainability cohort we talk about systems thinking and how do we think often in systems that limit limit our ways of moving when limit our ways of moving forward productively in society so i don't know like i think that i know that's not a clear answer but i think um all of those are valid standpoints and perspectives to begin from sure and, and, and i you know kind of curveball at the end that you neither of you asked to prep i'm just thinking what's the role of technology in all of this though right so you two sort of went one vision but here's this other and, and you weren't asked to address that, but I could just see somebody maybe asking that. Um, Gabriel, you had a question, and then um, I'm seeing two in the chat box. We'll go to it. Seth. If you got a bail for class, go for it. Appreciate your time. Um, I think the rest of us can can hang out as long as we we want. Lisa, right? You don't have to be anywhere at one yourself. Okay, cool. So, so Gabriel, um, please go to your question, and and if you all if other people got to go, we'll record um, as long as we are having a conversation. It'll be up on our um, YouTube channel on sustain.cc.edu. So Gabriel, please. Yeah, so this is a question for both Lisa and Seth. Seth, if you uh, have a few more minutes, if not, that's fine, I understand. Uh, but I find this topic uh, that we were just on very, very interesting, which is how, the, um, how these indigenous traditional uh, methods of agriculture start to intersect with scientific innovation. And there's so much potential there, but at the same time, uh, there's, there's also uh, this, this interesting clash where basically you have to reconcile two different ways of knowing, right? Because the, the traditional, the indigenous agriculture is based on other, um, other cultural ways of understanding the world systems and understanding the, what agriculture itself is. And that gives rise to so many uh, amazing uh, regenerative practices. So what happens when that becomes combined with scientific objectivism and you have a point where maybe science for the point of uh, creating greater efficiency starts to uh, take that apart and materialize it. And at some point, maybe have a moment where science is telling the uh, traditional practice of agriculture, uh, this is objectively the best way to do things. Uh, your tradition, now that we've picked it apart, is wrong. Would that be missing the point? Would that ultimately just lead uh, to more destructive practices down the line? It seems like we're almost going to have to translate between the two different epistemologies in a way that's respectful of both and uh, creating uh, uh, some sort of synthesis. And maybe this is where things like Afrofuturism comes in. Um, and maybe this is just where ex scientific experimentation comes in and understand creating some understanding between the two. So I'd appreciate your guys' uh, perspective on that. I got, I got to run, but just real quick. So we already kind of do that. We already deal with that, right? So we have, um, we have um, science that's sort of exploring different ways to improve agriculture, improve crop yields. And at the same time, we have 
um, crop producers. So for example, here in South Carolina, Clemson does a lot of agricultural research and there are interpreters of that agricultural research that bring it and must um, uh, get into dialogues with the actual producers and they compromise, right? So producers have ways of doing things based on um, historical ways that they've always done things. Uh, the, the scientist from Clemson has new ways of, uh, of, of going about the same thing. So um, there's a, somebody called an extension agent that sort of acts as a go-between the academic piece and, the, and the, the practitioner, right? And so we already sort of have a model for that. So um, with that, I got to run, but thanks for that question. Great question. Thanks all. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Seth. Um, hey, Jen and Blake, do we do you mind if Lisa combines your two questions into one? I, I, I think they maybe resonate with one another. Uh, I don't know if uh, you two are still here. Um, yeah, Lisa, sure, you not able to at see all. the chats? Not at all. Lisa, you, you're able to, you, you're seeing the chats? You able to see them okay? I, I haven't read, read it. With that. I did have a response to Gabriel's question, no. Okay, um, so I haven't read that and I, I will read it. Um, in a second, but I think Gabriel, I, I love the question that you're asking because it is so deeply tied to how we think and, and, you know, just the idea of epistemology, right? Like, how did you learn to think in the way that you do? How is, like, how, how do we know science is science or is valid science? I was reading some article which said that um, in the top journal scientific journal nature like less than like one percent of the studies are replicable um and so like what it, what does it mean to be a scientist and i think um one of the things that i appreciate about a um epistemological construct or a new way of reading the world um as it relates to Afrofuturism, especially because I'm in a space like Charleston, where I can wind up in a space that's a plantation any day, you know, and as a black person, I'm always trying to, to make sense of that. I think um, it helps us to, to challenge, to critique, you know, uh, the things that we may already just see as scientific thought um, or scientific inquiry. And um, one of the things that I think a lot of Black women writers do is they begin to see, like, for instance, the waste that is around them as symbolic of the ways in which their own lives or they're seeing waste appear in their own lives or their own lives wasting away. So they're beginning to draw these um, uh, inferences between how their own degradation is tied to the degradation of the earth or the planet that we're supposed to, to hold sacred. So I, I think, I, I really love your question because I think it's you beginning to ask and challenge um, all of the things, like the way in which we we build a future society. So so thank you for that. Yeah, and thank you for your answer. I, I think what I'm kind of getting from this is that, you know, the first step is, is uh, recognizing that all these different diverse systems have value. There is no one answer. And yeah. once we recognize that, we can say, okay, how can we move forward with all the tools in our toolbox? You know, we, it's, it's like we're only using one tool right now. We're using a hammer for everything. But if we use more of the different tools, we can't, without, and doing our best to, to see that they all have value in different situations, maybe we can uh, just create more innovation and just have an awareness that we're trying not to step on each other's feet uh, in doing so. And we're just going to do so with good faith and try to have the best outcome because ultimately we all want the best outcome. We want to use anything that's going to get us there. Beautiful. I love it. Thank you. Nice. And, and so perfect. Uh, see, thanks, Gabriel. Seeking from that, Lisa, if we, this will be our final one. You're all, we're over, but we still got a decent crowd. And I think there's, there's hunger, no pun intended to, um, sort of uh, have this discussion a little deeper. So um, Jen is basically asking, uh, how do we move beyond the concept of property give, deeper into climate change? And, and Blake is sort of asking, how do we cultivate sort of a deep ecological consciousness locally um, to, to sort of create these communities of flourishing for each other where food and, and 
um, interacting with the land is central, if I can paraphrase it that way. Um, so yeah, Lisa, any, any sort of thoughts as we wrap up on you know, how you might put those two things in dialogue? Yeah, I think those are two great questions that I would pose to like, you know, the community to ask them, um, or to ask like a broader question. I don't think there's any one particular response as Gabriel has kind of like brilliantly alluded to. Um, I, I like Jen's question of, you know, if property or, being treated as property gives you a certain feeling for the land. Um, how does that, you know, create a particular different vision? And I think the short answer to that then would be how do we, you know, how are we able to exist in a space without feeling um, whether it's pro police brutality creep up on you, whether it's not feeling like racism or, you know, those ways in which you feel racism, right? That kind of begins to serve as the roadmap for creating a more equitable or just um, landscape or geography. Um, I know Catherine McKittrick has this concept called geographies of resistance, but I think Sometimes when you don't have to resist, that could be a standing point or a starting point for thinking about um, it, you know, like a more freer society as it relates to climate change or environmental security and environmental justice. And I'm sorry, I'm not like Jen pinpointing exactly or like giving you like very direct questions. I mean, I'm sorry, direct answers, but- That's, that's very helpful. Thank you. I appreciate your thoughts about it. So no worries. Okay. Blake, anything more you wanted to, to, to add to, to that and, and dialogue with Lisa on? Did that get at what, what you were thinking too? I, I mean, I think all these questions are great for all of us to think about as, as faculty and staff, but also for students who are gonna have to figure these, these answers out through climate change, right? Um, these issues aren't, aren't gonna go away. They're only gonna become more pronounced. Yeah, Blake, I, I see you took your mood off. Go for it. Yeah, it, just just to summarize it, I, I, I'm thinking what Lisa's saying, alternatives to a di dominion thesis, which is that mm. we're just supposed to be in control. And, and I just look across the street and I see neighbors spray herbicides because they don't like the particular weed and <laughs> that's growing. And, and, you know, it's a self-interested uh, wanting to make this on a neighborhood level, but I think it's also altruistic that all of us could contribute to that. And I'm just wondering how you begin to have those conversations across the street. Um, uh, so that, that I'm just looking for some neighborhood advice, that's all. But, but I, think, I think Lisa Lisa was getting at it, but it's um, how, how do you take the philosophy and turn it into a praxis as well? Mm. Yeah, I like to, whenever I'm talking or whenever I'm teaching this to my students, I really do, um, draw from like the five key layers of sustainability um, that, you know, the Sustainability Literacy Institute um, champions, and that is thinking about the intersectional ways in which, um, you know, the unequal access to the environment manifests. So that's the economic, that's the ecological, that's the social, the political, um, and then the personal. And when I teach it, I teach it from the, the bottom up. So thinking about the personal, like, like, your, like your morals, your values, your emotional attachments, your fears, your shadows, how all of that becomes indicative of how you move throughout the world and how you decide who, who should have access to things. Um, so in putting, as it relates to putting it into practice, practice, I think it begins with the self. I think it begins with how you identify who you think deserves, you know, um, it, it, who you think deserves access to this space or this society. And then the effects, if we're thinking about it or moving up from, um, or thinking about it from like the bottom up approach. If it's the personal, then it goes to the worldview. How are herbicides affecting everyone else around you? Um, and do you care about that? You know, like if that's not something you care about, then that's not a thing that you 
begin to acknowledge or or try to advocate for some kind of change. Um, so I think teaching from that bottom up approach or inserting those intersectional identities as it relates to the personal, that's where I, I like to begin. Uh, if I could say something, Blake, about the, the neighborhood praxis, one of the things that I've had some, a little bit of luck with is just the, just starting conversations about for example, how interesting it is that we consider certain plants weeds, because it's it's often I find people the people you know that live around me the people that I talk to they hadn't thought about that before like they haven't they hadn't thought about the fact that a particular plant's considered a weed as opposed to a plant and like what that means and how that labels it in a particular way and it generates a particular set of emotional responses such that it's undesirable and you have to get rid of it. And you know, the, your, your willingness to use a poison to kill a living thing is being generated by, by something as simple as, oh, that's a weed, that's bad. I need to get rid of it. And so, and, and so without there being any sort of accusation or any sort of, you know, you're destroying the planet by doing that or whatever, just, just even raising the question isn't it interesting, you know, that we do this, that, that we call things weeds? I've, I've had some really fascinating conversations and sometimes people are a little off put by it at first, but then later on they come back and we have more conversations. And I think that that's, if there's gonna be anything that's gonna help to start raise that awareness, sometimes just thinking about our language and the simple way in which our language has these really powerful effects is really helpful. And I think that ties really well, Lisa, into the idea that you just start at the personal level, thinking about these things and talking about them. And yes, and a lot of weeds also have medicinal properties like dandelion weed. Dandelion roots and dandelion weeds grow all around us and we think of it as a, a weed, right? But then this ties into what Seth was saying about thinking about those traditional or indigenous um, agricultural models, which they say, what grows around you in many ways, maybe what you need in the moment. And so dandelion root um, or dandelion weed is known for like cleansing the liver um, and like just cleansing the body. And so I think even changing, like you said, Jennifer, the, you know, the language that we use or how we relate to something like a weed, right? And how we think of it as a nuisance um, might, be, might be a good starting point, Blake, for getting your community. <laughs> together in um like getting rid of the herbicides and things y'all gabriel i see your your coming um actually darcy and i got a one o'clock we got to get to we've been postponing so so we're going to stop hosting um uh lisa do you mind if people follow up um one-on-one -on -one with you are, are you okay with uh gabriel tracking you down with a follow-up if he wants yes please i would love to okay. talk to you for gabriel cool, cool so yeah um, everybody, thanks. Uh, we got an, another event next Wednesday, Ray Andre and the evening is gonna be following up things we can do to bring leadership and to bring uh, solutions to the climate crisis. So everybody's invited to that. And, and please go to sustain.cc.edu for more information. There you go, take the climate pledge. All these talks of Climate Fridays through the year are, are going to be up, most of them already are. And yeah, thanks everybody for your time today. Thank you, Lisa for sharing your passion and wisdom with us. Thank you everybody for your good questions. Good luck with finals everybody and staying safe and uh, maybe see you next week at the Ray Andre talk. All right, bye.